Thanks so much, Anthony. It's uh, an honor to be here, and I'm excited to be here with uh, my colleague, Pierre, who I've been uh, fortunate enough to read through the text. And like Anthony said, we're both contributing to an exciting issue on the planet. So hoping to get into a number of discussions today to highlight some of the major concepts in the text and, and to hear a bit from Pierre to elaborate on some of those things. But Anthony did a pretty good job uh, contextualizing the book, and I, I just wanted to add a little bit that um, I, I took away that this you know main hypothesis that that the book is examining is to what extent growth and, and technology you know have uh, allowed us some sort of semblance right of control and through that a semblance of freedom uh, with how we you know regard and relate to to the material world the natural world uh, and and now this is coming. Um, into conflict, given the conditions that we're finding ourselves in with anthropogenic climate change. And so there's a certain dilemma that is being explored throughout the book in both a philosophical sense and also in a historical sense, which I really appreciated and moving through this history, I have ideas. And this is this dilemma of either we're giving up maybe on certain 19th century ideals, such as freedom in the face of the ecological constraints that climate change uh, is putting out for us, or perhaps we'll face our own demise or decline, but stick to these senses of autonomy and freedom that have, uh, you know, has served us prior to climate change. And so, you know, there seems to be this dilemma and Pierre kind of uh, nicely summarizes this as, you know, are we left with either an authoritarian ecology or a freedom uh, without tomorrow? both bleak options. And a nice thing, right, a, a thing to hold on to and hope is that we're not left, you know, on either horns of these dilemmas, that there's a solution and a way out that requires a certain kind of level of critique and reconceptualizing how we're thinking of many of the concepts that maybe we've taken for granted uh, prior to this ecological age that we find ourselves in. And so that's what I, you know, I hope to explore today. And I think maybe one of the, the dominant questions that we'll be exploring that the text explores is, is how can we even understand certain kinds of ideals like freedom in the age of climate crisis, right? Freedom can be gained only by, and this is our way out, right? Establishing a socializing and sustainable relationship with the material world. So how do we do this is quite the challenge, um, but it doesn't seem like we have very many options. So we might as well turn all our attention and, and especially theorizing to it. And that's why we're very grateful um, to Pierre for doing this sort of work. So Pierre, just to actually get started before we get into too much of the, the nitty gritty conceptual work, uh, I thought it could be wonderful for us to hear and to learn a little bit more about the context within which this project emerged, how it might relate to some of your other interests. Uh, you know, what was this driving question that led you to engage in this form of both historical and normative inquiry? Because it's, it's a nice, unique um, approach of also being able to do this intellectual history. So if you could give us some background of how you got involved into the project. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Simona. That, that, was, that was a wonderful introduction. And uh, um, yeah, I can give some, some context about how this book came into being. So I'm, um, I'm a French philosopher, so I was trained in a very classic understanding of what philosophy is and should be. You know, basically in France, we are taught about the great philosophical systems of history, uh, Plato, uh, Descartes, Kant, etc. And we kind of visit this like, uh, like a museum. Um, so after I, 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 I accomplished my training, my basic training in philosophy, I got kind of uh, tired of this. And I really got interested in, in social sciences. I started reading Durkheim, Marcel Mauss, the, the French school of sociology, anthropology. And I ended up writing my PhD on the history of French anthropology and how uh, uh, French anthropology from Durkheim to contemporary writers deals with the nature and society divide. I've always been interested in environmental stuff, but without really trying to incorporate it into my thinking. And with this PhD, it was my first step into a, a more reflexive take on, well, this nature and society divide. So it, that was my first book, uh, which is called in French, uh, uh, The End of a Great Divide. And it's about the history of uh, French anthropology. And this, uh, uh, the reason why I got interested in, in this is because uh, I don't know how, how it, I don't know whether it's, it feels the same in, the, in England or in the US, but there was a very exciting moment uh, in um, the intellectual world 
around the work of Bruno Latour, of Philippe Descola, uh, around new achievements in uh, environmental history, in science and technology studies. I got very interested by, for example, by uh, uh, Carbon Democracy by Tim Mitchell, or by The Great Divergence by Kenneth Pomeranz. You know, all this new stuff that was, uh, uh, that was able to, 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 to make us think very differently about how we think about modern society, okay? So since I was kind of tired with classic philosophy, I tried to incorporate all this in my thinking. And since I was granted, I, I, I was very lucky to be granted a, a, a tenured uh, a position in philosophy at the CNS, I had plenty of time to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to further read science and technology studies, environmental history, the history of science, all this. And uh, um, parallel with that, I also got tired with the classic take uh, from philosophy on environmental matters. And that's the reason why I tried to develop what you, you, you both uh, introduced as the history, uh, the environmental history of ideas. It, I, I, it's an opposition with the history of environmental high ideas. I'm really not that much interested in how the consideration for nature as value appeared in the history of philosophy. It, it might be an interesting question, but that's not the question I'm interested in. I, just like uh, uh, Anthony uh, reminded us, I'm interested in virtually any uh, philosophical, legal, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, system of thought that uh, uh, incorporates uh, uh, some uh, 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 um, prescriptions on how to deal with nature, how to make it productive, how to make it safe, how to make it predictable, how to make it uh, 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 emancipating. And that's the reason why I, I, I want to write about people like John Locke, like Karl Polanyi, like all the stuff that's in the book, like Emile Durkheim, Saint-Simon, Proudhon, Karl Marx, obviously. It's not because I think they are uh, uh, forebearers of environmental thought, but it's because I think through their thinking, you can see how the, the, the relationship between autonomy or emancipation and uh, 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 very prosaic uh, uh, stuff like how we make nature productive, how this relationship is built through philosophical, legal, economic thought. So that's uh, uh, what I, I try to do in the book. Thanks, no, and you can see the sort of, uh, I think, different influences, right, that that led you to that in the book, which I really appreciated. And actually, you know, this point that you're bringing up um, about diverging from maybe more traditional questions about nature is actually something um, that I did want to talk to you about uh, more specifically. So I was hoping you could explain to folks a little bit more about how you address the conceptual challenges of, of even going about talking about nature and why you um, adopt the particular strategy that you do. So you argue in the book that you know the very concept of nature should undergo analysis rather than being the device or the tool of our theorizing, which I think is what you were just speaking to a little bit. And so you take on this strategy of, of breaking the concept up into parts uh, or into these different categories or themes within which you're going to then explore through the analysis. So I was hoping that you could elaborate for us why you chose the concept of subsisting, the concept of dwelling, and the concept of knowing as the most helpful concepts to articulate our relationships to the material world, how you were getting at the concept of nature that way, and why you took those three to be the most relevant for understanding how we could revise our thinking about this, you know, relationship with the natural world. Yeah, it's an important matter. Thank you. Um, well, you know, probably know that um, in the early 2000s, uh, even before, there was a huge debate about the, the very value of the concept of nature. You know, after people like Bruno Latour, or, or for example, uh, Donna Haraway, Isabel Stenger, or so people like that, the, the very use of the, the, the word nature was put into question. So we entered the phase of very speculative debates 
uh, 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 derived from constructivism. But, and I myself engaged with those debates in my first book. But then I was again kind of tired by those debates and I didn't want to, 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 uh, to decide whether nature was or not a good concept. I chose a different strategy that, uh, as you described, is breaking down the ID in different uh, 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 parts. And those parts indeed are uh, uh, subsistence, dwelling, and knowledge, or in French, uh, uh, And again, it's, it, it, it's still a way to deal with the, 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 the method of constructivism, okay? Uh, so the first part, uh, subsistence, could be renamed. Uh, it, it, well, it, 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 uh, it's uh, questioning about the social construction of resources, of the very idea that nature or the outside physical world is a resource. What kind of uh, uh, concepts, technologies, uh, 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 know-hows are involved in the constitution of nature as a resource? So it's about labor, the organization of labor, about technology, about law, law property law in particular. It's, uh, it's about how uh, wealth is allocated through different mechanisms. So that's the first part. Con the social construction of nature as a resource. Then the second part is dwelling. And this is the social construction of nature as sovereign ter territory as a patchwork of different sovereign territories. So there is uh, 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 one of the, 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 the three uh, 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 threads of the book is an interrogation about political, uh, about territoriality, okay? So that's why uh, there are lots of developments on sovereignty and on the limits of sovereignty, classic and contemporary, but also, uh, it, it, it might be uh, uh, secondary in the book, but very important to be also how we, we, we dwell into time, how we conceive of the present and obviously the future. So that's why that there are a lot of developments in the book about progress, about the, 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 the borders, boundaries. Okay. And the third part is knowledge. So that's classically the social constru construction of, of knowledge, of science, because of course, uh, 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 the, all those mechanisms through which uh, the modern conception of nature is built are highly reflexive. And that's, why, that's the reason why so many philosophers or so many people we like to call philosophers because that's sometimes, a lot of times anachronistic, uh, 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 are involved in the social construction of nature as a resource, as sovereign territory. So like, for example, one of the, 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 the purest example of this is when John Locke in the fifth chapter of uh, the, the, the second treatise uh, uh, on, on property deals at the same time with uh, uh, an agronomic matter, which is how to make nature more productive, how to improve on nature. So that's the first part, how to uh, on resource on uh, subsistence, <coughs> how this uh, 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 objective of making nature productive relates to the con to the to the construction of a new kind of uh, 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 legal entity that is a modern state with a new kind of citizenship, with the citizen as owner of of land. <coughs> And at the same time, that uh, uh, improving land and uh, uh, ruling over a new territory, that's the colonial part of um, um, uh, I mean, that's all the product of the rational foundation of the modern state. So you have the three layers there and you, you have the same three layers in most of the, the authors I try to, to discuss and to uh, put it to stage in the book. 
and I, I hope, you know, we were mentioning a little bit, you know, back and forth earlier that that we can get a little bit more into sort of the consequences of unearthing this. And and uh, so I'm excited to to talk a little bit more about subsistence towards the end, and, and especially in the context of, of climate displacement, which is the work that I'm, I'm mostly focusing on these days. So I actually wanted to start with dwelling first and, and see if we could talk a little bit more about that concept and how it's working, because I think it's really important and the observations that you're making in the book. So one question that I had about dwelling in particular and this, this piece, right, of, of nature and our relationships that you're identifying is I was wondering how that concept could help us or be useful in addressing certain challenges uh, regarding adaptation. And so there's this larger question regarding, you know, at what scale adaptation, you know, at governance should be at and addressed. So I was wondering if the notion of dwelling gives us some particular kinds of insight, you know, normative insight about what we ought to be, you know, doing going forward uh, regarding the kinds of relationships um, that we ought to be protecting or preserving or enabling certain kinds of capabilities that we ought to be facilitating uh, through adaptation and our mechanisms of adaptation. So I, I was wondering if you could expand from sort of identifying the concept of dwelling to maybe how it might establish certain kinds of obligations. I know you you refrain a bit from saying that we should have these like overarching principles, right, guiding our normative thinking. Uh, so I don't want you to <laughs> have to necessarily, you know, identify a guiding principle in that case. But I'm wondering if there's some sort of normative guidance that you take this notion of dwelling uh, to give us when we're making certain kinds of, you know, decisions about what adaptation should look like and at, at what levels of governance maybe adaptation should uh, proceed at. Yeah, maybe there are two two different things in your question. The first would be uh, 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 thinking historically about how the very idea of uh, 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 produ producing space change through time. And maybe the, 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 the most obvious thing to say uh, is that there is a complete reversal in uh, uh, the relationship we establish between uh, uh, the human industrial modernizing endeavor and the outside world. Because if you, if you, if you look at history, you you'll see that uh, 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 there, there has always always been always in modernity in modern times always been some kind of providentialism that uh, 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 that uh, lays a ground where uh, uh, society has to make the world livable, safer, more predictive, more uh, uh, anticipable, and. That was the that's the 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 the, the continuity inside in modern societies uh, uh, from very basic basic ideas uh, you find for example in Hobbes to make the world secure safe through contemporary ecological engineering you have the continuity of this link between security. <clears throat> and the uh, uh, ecological interven and intervention. Uh, but now, maybe this relationship is going upside down because we have to conceive of society as, some, as a community of people that cannot force itself into a world that is conceived as fundamentally uh, 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 um, at hand for science and technology. So that's, for example, uh, uh, for people like uh, uh, Sheila Jasanov, the, 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 the STS scholar, that's a very important idea, this crucial idea about what modern of the idea of development. And the, 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 the second aspect of your question is uh, uh, more clearly related to the idea of security. And that is actually uh, the book I'm trying to write now, uh, the follow-up uh, uh, after Affluence and Freedom, which is going to be not on how affluence constrains our idea of freedom, but how affluence constrains our idea of peace, stability, security. So there is in parallel of 
this the pact between affluence and freedom, there is also a pact between affluence and security. And again, this pact is uh, experiencing huge transformation now because I can bet, and uh, probably you too, that uh, uh, international security cannot rely anymore on the full development of productive forces. So, <coughs> so yes, uh, uh, that's that's maybe the the well the, the 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 full development of the idea of dwelling as a way to historicize historicize and criticize modern. Uh, 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 modern uh, ID, modern political ideas. That's it. Sounds really exciting that you're going to have this follow up because I, you know, I was, and especially when talking about displacement issues, right? Some of the concern is that the motivating force, um, when thinking about dwelling or when thinking about livability, is compromise. That the motivating force to do something is to maybe make appeals to, let's say, national security. Right, but in doing so, or international security, you run the risk of all sorts of, you know, problematic and, and undemocratic uh, tendencies when national security gets brought up, right, or certain kinds of xenophobic, you know, uh, justifications for immigration policy and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'm wondering actually if you've thought too, you know, much about what you're writing in the second book, but uh, how you make distinctions even in the idea of security. So, you know, whether we should be avoiding maybe certain kinds of discourses about national or international security and bring it back to certain conversations about human security. And so maybe to avoid some of those, um, you know, risks in the dialogue there. So you brought that up. So I, I don't know if you're thinking about sort of, <laughs> yeah, the, no, no. you know, conflicts well, with these. Th there is a huge debate nowadays about uh, 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 climate and security, obviously. Right. And well, to me, the, 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 the major issue in the book in Affluence and Freedom was how the welfare state could can or cannot survive the, 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 the climate uh, catastrophe. How we can conceive again uh, 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 the way people are protected by the state or by any uh, institution and how they, they, they can be protected at the same time against the market and against the very consequence of their own understanding of freedom, you see? Because if freedom is what you obtain when you remove nature as a constraint, as an humiliation of the, 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 the will to improve and the will to, to become autonomous, then what you get at the end is a climate catastrophe as both an outcome of our collective understanding of freedom and as a challenge to freedom itself. And it could, the same could be said about security. After, uh, uh, after World War II, the, the, the main, uh, 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 the prevalent idea of, uh, in, uh, of um, international security is related to in oil and coal. And if you make economies that are deeply interdependent, you, 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 you can be sure that those different countries won't go to war against each other. You know, that's the explicit uh, uh, warning of uh, Robert Schuman, the one of the uh, founders of the European Union, if France and Germany have their economies completely mutually uh, interdependent, they will never go to war. And the best element you have at hand to do that is coal. Uh, and there you see very concretely the link between security, in other words, peace, that's a neo-Kentian pro project, peace and a very contingent material uh, 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 support that is coal and then oil and even nuclear power in a way. So is it possible now to understand that climate change is a threat for security without understanding it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an excuse to protect Northern wealthy Western countries against a threat that is conceived as 
as coming from outside, like for example, migrants. So that's a huge, uh, 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 that's a huge challenge for contemporary philosophy and also, of course, for uh, contemporary politics. Yes, I sink my teeth <laughs> into that challenge whenever I'm doing my work. And I think you're pointing to, uh, right, the need to have this different kind of articulation about understanding, um, you know, where the obligations are coming from uh, and, and to sort of break down <coughs> the tendency towards this north-south divide or seeing it as you know, the other and invasions and that sort of sort of dialogue. So yeah, in my, in my own work, I'm trying to say that, you know, these obligations are attached to the state system itself and to certain kinds of understandings. And so you can hopefully get out of, of some of that paradigm. Um, and, and I guess this conversation about security that we're having, I think, uh, links up a little bit to some questions that I had. And I don't know if these are pushback or critique or maybe just clarifying questions about some of your discussion on risks in the book and limits and thresholds, which I found really engaging. Um, and so you, you argue that the sort of status quo or the paradigm of risk that's been operating is not helpful, right? Can't serve us in facing these current challenges that climate change poses. So I thought it might be helpful, and maybe you touched on this a little bit in, in enumerating what you were saying about security, but I thought it'd be helpful if you could briefly describe how you understand that status quo paradigm of risk that you're critiquing. So kind of setting up what you wanna move away from or think we ought to move away from. And then I wanted to think about how that might actually relate to certain kinds of challenges of adaptation. And so let me put an example out there and maybe that'll help uh, ground the discussion a little bit. So I'm thinking that right now, right, there's some, some resources from the US that's that are being poured into this idea of uh, developing a predictive models of extreme weather events, right? Um, and that is obviously to address risk. And engaging in that kind of resource development, uh, I'm wondering if you would see that as part of the old paradigm and, and if so, why that might be problematic. Because I'm thinking that these kinds of uh, sort of scientific engagements and the modeling might be seen as also filling a certain kind of epistemic gap, a knowledge gap that has moral consequences. So it's this idea that in getting more information, we have the ability to have a better, you know, disaster risk reduction framework, and that we might be able to start working towards solutions that could guard against displacement. And also that there, it would potentially increase solutions and transparency for, you know, not just the global north, but places in the global south to better prepare if, right, we have this better predictive modeling. Um, and then on a more low, so that's on a larger scale. On a local scale, it might be able to afford maybe not this specific kind of <coughs> modeling, but similar kinds of projects, right, in, in disaster risk reduction frameworks that could be developed. Uh, could help make transparent, for example, um, if you're buying a house or renting a house, right? To what extent uh, it can factor into your housing preferences, the level of risk um, that that property is subject to, is it in a flood zone, that sort of thing. And I, I would imagine that making that sort of information transparent could possibly help address any kind of inequalities uh, regarding risk. But I, I know you are worried to some extent about uh, the sort of capitalizing on risk. So, um, so I thought, yeah, if you could say, like, do you see those as part of the problematic paradigm? How do you understand the public paradigm of risk? And uh, are, are there tweaks or ways that we could utilize these kinds of tools in ways that you would find to be more just? Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, yeah, so there, there is a chapter in the book called uh, Risk and Limits. And it, uh, it actually comes from a, a paper I wrote before the book on uh, the meaning of the idea of the Anthropocene in, in, for social sciences. So the, the idea of the, 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 the paper initially was that the, the, uh, the reason why the Anthropocene is relevant for social science that it comes after an, a, a previous phase where the crisis of uh, the relationship between modern societies charged by two different paradigms. The first was paradigm of risk and the second was the paradigm of the limits. So uh, regarding the limits, it's, as you can guess, uh, uh, the, the ideas developed in the Club, uh, Club of Rome, in the degrowth movement, that, that uh, there is a physical contradiction between the modern mode of development and the limits of the earth. 
but that's not what you're interested in. It's more about risk. So the second paradigm, the risk, was and the prototype of that is uh, the book by Ulrich Beck, uh, Risk Society, obviously. And so, so the idea was that there is a crisis that cuts through the whole range of modern political concepts, uh, the state, science, capital, classes, and because of the, 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 the environmental and medical outcomes of the modern uh, mode of development. But in a way, uh, uh, the framework developed within uh, and through the concept of risk uh, contributed to make modern societies more confident about their ability to anticipate the uncertain, uncertain events by uh, uh, the calculus of chances, okay? And as you said, the whole, uh, 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 <coughs> whole economy grew up on the idea of risk. Well, actually it, it, it used to exist before risk society, but there was a, a, a further development of this economy. So, uh, and to borrow the uh, word used by, by one of my colleagues here in Paris, uh, uh, risk society might uh, be conflated with uh, disinhibition toward the production of risk, since we believe that we can uh, 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 govern the production of risk through the democratization of science, through, you know, those ideas that used to be very popular in the 90s and early 2000s, you make the lay person participate into the debate. Over the, 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 the installation of a, a, a railway or a nuclear plant. And since you, 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 uh, you rely on, on a, a, a public reason, you can only have the best rational outcome possible. You see the idea? It, if, if you democratize science and decision, uh, 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 you will dissolve the, contra the contradiction between the modern model de of development and uh, natural constraints. And that was kind of a dream, don't you think? <laughs> and you see the idea, so it doesn't mean at all that we shouldn't develop a better uh, a meteor meteorological system that we shouldn't help communities anticipate uh, 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 the, the, the uh, um, brutal events like meteorological events. Absolutely not. It just means that we cannot uh, uh, make risk management the, 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 the all-encompassing concept and a, a policy tool to manage the climate crisis, because the climate crisis is way more than a risk. It, it, it goes back to how we organize uh, uh, technology, law, labor. It completely reshapes class relationships. It doesn't dissolve class relationships. It reshapes class relationships. So the whole, uh, so to speak, the whole anthropological arc of human organizations is put into questions by the climate crisis. And risk management is only you know, one segment in this whole uh, uh, sociological or anthropological arc. And I don't think it's, it, it's, it's even, uh, 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 um, I mean, it's even feasible to, to, to make risk the, the 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 overarching paradigm i think that's very helpful and I, I i tend to agree and i think if if there's a continuation of the the dream project right uh, that came with the the sort of democratic participation or public reason um from the last couple of decades might be in this context you know we can't have risk alone but definitely on the decision making side about what to do in light of that risk information um, we ought to have much more uh transparency and also participation in, in the decision making factors so you don't have 
you know, agents in the global north making decisions and even, you know, for the global south and then also even uh, communities being able to participate since they might know, you know, on the local level and have better, better informed things. So how, how we can kind of bring that, that element there. Um, so we, we actually have a number of, of questions in the chat for you. So I thought to read a few and then uh, I, I of course have more questions. So <laughs> if we have time, I'll insert those, but I wanna give those in chat a chance. So uh, the first question here that I wanted to read off for you is that the blurb to your book uh, mentions that political emancipation, that concept. And, and this questioner says that, uh, they tend to think that in terms of uh, survival, they think in terms of survival rather than emancipation. So they were interested in what kind of emancipation you're aiming at in the book. So maybe this is a chance for you to, to elaborate on the concept of freedom, uh, right, that you think can thread this needle and not uh, hit the dilemmas that we talked about earlier. You're, you're muted. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so one of the, 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 the most important things I'm attached to is that uh, uh, we do not forget about political thought. I mean, one of the huge risks that comes with climate crisis is, so to, to put it simply, naturalism, is going back to a completely naturalistic conception of social coexistence. It would be the idea that we are only a living species. We are a population and not a society. What we experience is the threat of extinction, for, exist, for, for example, and not something that could be framed by political notions. So the reason why I, 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 I keep talking about freedom, emancipation, social organization is Precisely because with the climate crisis appears or reappears political naturalism. And one of the outcomes of political naturalism is neo-Malthusianism. And that probably is the, 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 the most uh, 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 visible risk, political risk. So we need to remain inside a socio-political framework. And my idea inside this normative concept of freedom, it's just to, 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 to show, to prove that freedom itself has an ecological history, has a, a material, material history, that according to the material uh, world you live in, whether it is mostly uh, uh, agricultural or industrial or post-industrial and climate-stricken uh, uh, world, our conceptions of freedom move and change through time. And one of the most uh, spectacular thing about, things about the concept of freedom we inherit from the past is that it is equated with the removal of natural constraints. And one of the most, to be fair, on, on the most beautiful outcomes of this idea is the welfare system in France in particular. The idea that the weak, the ill, the old are protected, that, that, there is a, that we put in common some parts of our wealth to take care of this, the young, the old, the, those who cannot work, etc. etc. This is completely anti-Malthusian. You see what I mean? Freedom was and still is conceived as something that, that uh, 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 makes us break from nature. And I don't think this is a bad idea at all. That's, 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 that, that might be the, 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 I mean the, 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 the most precious legacy we have from the past. And we should try to to, to make this legacy still alive, even when something like a, a natural uh, catastrophe happens. So that's why I try in the end of the book to show that uh, uh, the social question 
and the climate or ecological question as the same, not only because we have to treat climate issue as a social issue, but because historically speaking, the social issue has always been about how we deal with the environment, with subsistence, with dwelling, with scientific knowledge. And I know uh, uh, that maybe the question is coming. I know that there are very different conceptions of freedom in different societies, I mean, in space and time. And I absolutely don't pretend covering every conception of freedom that appeared in human history. I'm, in this book, I'm, I'm only concerned with modern, uh, modern and Western conceptions of freedom. And probably uh, we, in, in, the, in, the, in the legacy of human thought, we have examples of uh, uh, forms of freedom that are, that are not so much uh, confiscated by the, the idea of affluence of the illimited economy. But it's not that easy to, 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 uh, to uh, I mean, to, to make those ideas relevant in our world. So that's a very open, very open uh, answer. <laughs> And this maybe this uh, is is the questions right that you were expecting. It's not specifically on freedom, but um, I'm going to kind of combine two questions and then give you a, a second one, so we can we can get them out there, and then maybe you can address them in turn. But uh, this one question is is to, you know directed about whether you would understand the environmental crisis as a crisis of Western modernity, right? You're, you're already talking about these conceptions of freedom that you were just saying. And the, the questioner was asking this because, you know, of course the, the concept of climactic change has existed for thousands of years, you know, for example, within indigenous communities. And I would say the very kinds of, you know, concerns and considerations, uh, and, and we know that, you know, Kyle White's work discusses this, that the notions of the Anthropocene, right, or, or certain kinds of apocalyptic narratives uh, that we might be engaging with um, in theorizing are, sort of erasing the kinds of conceptions that indigenous communities have already experienced through climate colonialism and therefore also erases the capacity for you know resilience uh if you're just kind of seeing them as this apocalyptic challenge so so this questioner I, i've added to that but was you know was wondering if um you know in taking this limited slice is is there something to be you know considered there and and I think the other half to this question and their question is about it, to what extent, you know, we ought to be expanding uh, how we're teaching and engaging with thought in, in our philosophy classes. I know I, you know, I teach a number of, of an, um, indigenous climate justice texts and environmental philosophy that comes from those communities. So how, how are those kinds of considerations maybe playing in your mind or, or in the context of the work? So that, that's one camp. And the other maybe related question uh, that might be in the same vein that you could take up is this notion of climate apartheid. So another attendee wanted to ask, does your book engage with this link between modernity and colonial violence and domination? Uh, and they say it's not something they know much about, would be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, and I do know you talk a little bit about colonialism, so maybe this will, you can address maybe both questions within that. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, regarding the, the, the first question, um, in a way, uh, we could say that with uh, this modern conception and production of nature, there are two tragedies regarding uh, indigenous communities. The first tragedy is that obviously we destroyed those communities, or we almost destroyed those communities, okay. But the second tragedy is that we cannot really retrieve their conceptions of freedom and community for our own world because those conceptions are conceptions that used to be or that are still relevant for communities who do not have our level of technological agency. So, and that's why I'm talking about a tragedy, a second tragedy, because as, uh, uh, as uh, for example, Claude Lévi-Strauss put it, used to put it, those people 
are and the 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 the, the, the collective imagination, collective ideation they they they, they produced is well, we have become completely a strange world. It's not only a matter of ideas, it's a matter of how ideas are adjusted, are fitting to a world. So in the Anthropocene, in a world completely reshaped by technological agency and in a way by a, 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 a capitalistic agency, those systems of thought, those, those conceptions of freedom that are rooted in contexts where technological agency is lower, are maybe they are not useless, but they are clearly not well adjusted to the world we ended up producing. So, and it's also a matter of responsibility, you know, we have to be responsible of what we, we, what we did what we're still doing and assuming that and it in a way means forging political categories, political challenges, political power struggles that are very much uh, uh, rooted in this new reality. And I say that because <clears throat> as I said earlier, I, 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 my, my first uh, uh, um, scientific research was on the history of anthropology and it was all about the debate on the new debate on animism totemism and all this so i'm very uh, uh, i mean i'm very sensitive to the fact that the modern experience is only a small part of the human experience but being a small part uh, uh, means nonetheless that it's uh, materially speaking something huge so that's the second tragedy, uh, so to speak. <coughs> and yes, uh, my book is is uh, is not a book about, uh, 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 not primarily about the north and south divide regarding to environmental matters. It's not it's not a book about about an global environmental inequalities. But there is one chapter, chapter four, if I remember well, that uh, 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 tries to deal with those issues because. One essential dimension, <coughs> and I could go back to the, the example of John Locke, in that it contributed to uh, characterize non-modern experiences of nature as illegitimate, because precisely those people were supposed to be unable to improve on nature, and through this, to, to show that they were rational communities. So the divide between uh, 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 the traditional and the modern goes along a divide between the ability or inability to domesticate, to improve on land, on nature. <clears throat> and with this, obviously, comes the uh, uh, colonial, imperial, endeavor. So obviously there is a deep relationship between the, the modern pact between affluence and freedom and how modern societies dealt with cultural otherness. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the few pillars of modern societies, of modern capitalism or modern mode of production. <clears throat> and clearly one of the one of the 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 the, the boomerangs of history uh, uh, is that uh, uh, we cannot deal with climate issues without dealing with climate justice and i know that uh, next week or the week after there is a discussion about climate reparations uh, am i right anthony T tomorrow i think right oh yeah. tomorrow okay yeah <laughs> uh, 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 and beyond the idea of climate reparations, uh, uh, there is a huge debate on uh, how the North, the wealthy North can provide technological support, financial support to the South to help them both develop and escape the climate crisis or try to deal with the climate crisis that was debated during the last uh, COP, the COP uh, 2026. 20, 
And we can see very clearly that the North decided not to engage seriously with those issues of uh, 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 um, climate justice. And just like with the, the, the COVID vaccine, without dealing with uh, uh, the mode of development in India, in Indonesia, in Africa, in you know, Mexico, uh, 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 we won't solve the, the problem. And just to, to second that um, and, and to plug, um, you don't want to miss the discussion uh, with Professor Taiwo, who writes about climate reparations and has written um, some public pieces on climate apartheid. So it, it will be a <coughs> sort of perfect segue into discussing um, some of these important issues. Um, Anthony, I, I wanted to double check. Do we have time for one more question I can throw in or should we leave it at that? It look, okay, so it looks like we have a chance for one more question. So I want to sneak this in. Uh, it, it's a topic that maybe didn't get directly addressed. So uh, one of our attendees asked that, what is the relevance of the controversy about anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism, sorry, and its implications for how you think about nature in your project? So in the way in which we anthropocentrize nature, is that coming into the conceptions of how you're distinguishing it maybe in the three parts or or moving away from the conception that you find to be uh, the thing you didn't want to be discussing so maybe we're, we're coming full circle to the nature question yeah uh, in light of that okay so it's not that i don't want to discuss anthropocentrism or the critique of anthropocentrism kind of issues kind of dissolves uh, uh, in my uh, method, because as I said earlier, I don't want to practice philosophy, uh, uh, purely normative philosophy. I don't want to be the kind of philosopher who decides what is the proper ethical normative ground on which we should build a, 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 a green oriented um, theory of justice of freedom of the state, etc. I'm more attentive to how our conceptions of freedom or security and our conception of, of nature are interconnected. <coughs> so in a way, I could say that I am clearly in the in the in the in the tradition of the critique of anthropocentrism precisely because I believe that the notion of freedom is not only about how I deal with you as, an, as another human and how you deal with me as another human, you know, in a very uh, Kantian uh, way. Uh, 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 I don't think that the source of political obligation comes from the strict uh, 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 field of interhuman uh, 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 relationships. There is always something that comes from uh, uh, how we deal with space, with resources, with time, with knowledge. So there is a, a, a third point in the triangle. So in that way, I am an ire of the critique of anthropocentrism in philosophy, but I wouldn't build a whole normative project on this critique precisely because we humans and we modern humans are the ones who should consider ourselves responsible for what's happening on the planet on the whole planet and that is a very uh, 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 anthropocentric concern you see what i mean it's us it's about us it's what we do it's how we think. So you see, I, I'm I'm kind of uh, 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 at odds with the anthropocentrism, non-anthropocentrism debate. For example, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate for the idea that animals are or should be completely equated with humans uh, on moral grounds, because uh, 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 horses and ants and are not responsible for what's happening. You see what I mean? 